Welcome to the Stefan Levera podcast focused on Bitcoin and Austrian economics. Learn the economics and technology of Bitcoin. Today I've got a really special guest. I know this has been a very highly anticipated episode with Plan B. But before that, a quick word on behalf of my sponsors. Firstly, Kraken. Kraken are the best Bitcoin exchange. Over my years in Bitcoin, I've been really impressed with the way they operate. They have really consistently offered a very strong focus on security. They have consistently acted ethically in the space under Jesse Powell's leadership. They are one of the longest standing Bitcoin exchanges. They're consistently rated the best. They've got a really high quality platform. They have they offer some of the best liquidity possible in the industry. They've got high trading volume and low fees. Kraken have 24 seven support. It's extremely quick to go through and set up it, whether you're an individual or whether you are on the institutional or business solution side. They offer the highest available API rate limits. There's a Kraken OTC desk. They offer five fiat currencies, and they also offer margin and futures trading. To learn more and sign up, go to the Kraken link in the show notes. Next, look into Unchained Capital. They're a Bitcoin financial services company offering a really cool two of three key multi-signature vault product. So you can use Trezor or Ledger, you still maintain control with your two hardware wallet keys and you reduce the single point of failure risk. This vault product is available both for individuals and also for institutions. Don't forget, if you create an Unchained Vault, you also get three free months of access to Safety and Moose's Bitcoin Standard Research Bulletin. Unchained also offers Bitcoin collateralized loans, so you can get USD liquidity without selling your Bitcoins, meaning you don't trigger a capital gains event. So that can be more tax efficient as well. Remember, while that loan is outstanding, the Bitcoins are stored in collaborative custody with Unchained Capital. So if you're interested to learn more and sign up, go to the Unchained Capital link in the show notes. So with the episode today with Plan B, he first appeared on episode 67, and this episode was one of the most downloaded episodes And I recommend you listen to that one first before listening to this one if you haven't already. Uh, And in this episode, we essentially talk about some further discussion on his stock-to-flow modeling. We explore this question of whether people now are trying to front-run the coming Bitcoin halvening. And we also discuss a few other questions around how many cycles could we anticipate this working for, as well as a few other ideas that Plan B is working on. On to the interview. Plan B. Welcome back to the show, mate. Thank you very much, uh, Stefan. I'm I'm glad to be here and, uh, and and great to be on the show again. Plan B, we had an incredible response to our first episode together. I mean, you built your following dramatically. You had a lot of positive feedback. Let's talk a little bit about that. Yeah, man, it it, it has been crazy. Uh, actually, it still is, uh, and I'm not not very much uh, used to it because I'm. Um, uh, as most of your listeners probably know, I'm um, an investor in traditional finance. Um, my employer is an institutional investor with a multi-billion dollar uh, balance sheet. And uh, yeah, I, I was not so much uh, used to, to Twitter and, and, and Medium articles, but since uh, the Medium article is out, and especially, uh, Stefan, since your, uh, your podcast, um, the response has been great and overwhelming, uh, basically. It's... it's um, yeah, help from people, feedback, useful comments, but also things like job offers, uh, business proposals. And uh, well, I guess the article was on, on um, a lot of uh, podcasts and mentioned in, in other articles, even on radio and TV in, uh, in the Netherlands. Uh, yeah, there's also much people working on, on Stock to Flow uh, right now. For example, there's a a Turkish translation of the uh, article, a German one in the making, um, two websites with uh, live stock to flow uh, charts available, and even a, a trading view indicator uh, out there. So it's yeah, it, it it has been great, and and currently I'm working with uh, with two quant teams on further refining and improving and testing the models. So uh, yeah, you um, expect at least two more articles. Uh, uh, summer next month. Fantastic! Uh, it's just excellent to see that you know you're getting a really positive response on your modeling work because it really was just something new. And I think it, who knows it may be the way that many people now start to look at this as a standard method of analyzing, um, and potentially, I mean, there are many implications as well. So imagine a miner, a Bitcoin mining company has to speculate through the cycle 
and they may in turn use some of this modeling to drive their own decisions. Exactly. Yeah, it's it's uh, the price and especially the um, expectation of price is it's, it's of course very difficult. Um, but but for miners, it's it's very uh, important to do that and to make their uh, as an entrepreneur their their investment uh, decisions upon. So so yeah, I got a lot of response from miners as well. Actually, I talked to to a lot of them. Um, you know what what's also very funny is that. Uh, uh, coming from a traditional finance uh, background, um, I noticed that maybe a lot of traditional finance uh, might not be in or even interested in Bitcoin, but that quant teams certainly are. Oh man, they! I talked to so many quants. I guess about ten percent of my followers at the moment is a quant somewhere at a bank or even a central bank or a hedge fund, and boy, did do they understand Bitcoin? And, and many have skin in the game too. So that makes me very, very optimistic. Look, let's uh, let's dive into some of the feedback a little bit. Now, one point that came up was around, oh, can you apply the stock to flow uh, analysis or modeling to altcoins? Uh, but I suppose the question would be, are altcoins unforgeably costly? Right. Yeah, that's the most uh, frequently asked question uh, that I got. Uh, can you make a stock to flow model for Litecoin or or, or a Bcash or a Ethereum? Um, so let's let's dive a little a little bit deeper there. Um, the thing with with um, with with a stock to flow analysis, indeed, is the uh, it's based on on forgeable costliness. So uh, maybe. Maybe go one step back for, for first-time listeners. Uh, stock to flow is um, stock or the reserve uh, reserves of something like Bitcoin, seventeen million, almost eighteen million uh, in stock, and the, and that's divided by flow. So stock to flow and flow is the production, and that's about uh, 0.7 million bitcoins per year at the moment. And if you divide those two, you get you get the number twenty five, and twenty five is the stock to flow number uh for for bitcoin and it's not just a a number um i mean i i called it scarcity a, a measure a quantitative measure of scarcity in the article but but really the key of stock to flow is the inability of production to inflate the stock uh, if the stock is large enough and the production is capped or restricted somehow then the production and the producers are Enable to inflate the stock, and we know um, what what kind of problems uh, you get when when uh, certain individuals or companies or, or or governments can inflate stock. Look at look at Zimbabwe, for example, where Mugabe can print and did print as many Zimbabwe dollars as he wanted, and with yeah disastrous effects for the economy. And the same with Maduro in Venezuela. And and you could say the same from uh, the, the dollar and the euro at the moment as well with quantitative easing. They're printing, I, I, I'm not allowed to say printing, uh, uh, but creating uh, electronic dollars and, 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 and euros and yens to bail out banks and, and whole economies. So the inability of production to inflate the stock, that's what, what stock to flow really is about, to, to prevent uh, things that we see in the fiat currencies in Zimbabwe, Venezuela, uh, and currently in quantitative easing. So uh, if, if we apply that to uh, crypto, if you like, um, then the thing like decentralization becomes very important. If one person, one company, or a country can decide to change the monetary policy, it's not decentralized. That then uh, the producer, th this person or, or, or government or company, can it, it will be able to to make more more coins and inflate the stock. Uh, for example, uh, take take Ripple. The uh, CEO of Ripple can can pre mine another uh, hundred billion uh, ripples if if he wanted that. And and if you look at Ethereum as well, that that was uh, there was no uh, no cap on the on the supply of Ethereum. And now they're they're they changed that, uh, so so they're changing the money supply. It's not 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 what it was or what it will be the money supply, but the fact that they can change it is uh, well that that's a thing I would be worried about as an investor, and um, that's totally different in Bitcoin. Bitcoin, you have this 
truly peer-to-peer -peer network with many nodes and uh, you can verify the money supply yourself. You're not dependent on a third party like a bank or a company or a data center to tell you how much the money supply is. Um, yeah, and, and it's, it's, uh, y you cannot change the money supply or, or change that, that, that magic 21 million uh, uh, coins number. And if you do, you're basically uh, hard forking uh, away from, uh, from Bitcoin. And yeah, I, I guess nobody will follow you, like, a bit like, uh, like Bitcoin Cash uh, did with the big blocks. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, you can do it, but, but don't expect people to follow you. Um, and maybe a last thing to mention is that that uh, on on the theoretical side of of uh, stock to flow on on altcoins, it money has to be hard to produce, expensive like gold. So there's lots of gold in the oceans, and and I even read this article about the asteroid, uh, the golden asteroid, uh, recently. Uh, it would be very expensive to mine the, that gold in the ocean or the asteroids, and that. That prevents it from happening, I guess. Uh, and the same for Bitcoin. Uh, it has a hash-based uh, proof of work with a very high hash rate. So it's it's it costs a lot of electricity to mine Bitcoins, and that's totally different for a lot of altcoins, of, uh, of course. So, for example, Ripple again has no proof of work, or Bitcoin Cash uh, has almost no hash rate, so no security. Again, that would make me a little bit nervous as an investor and. Uh, people who'd like to know more about this, um, it was Nick Zabo who uh, who uh, invented the term and, and, and described uh, unforgeable costliness uh, in great length. So make sure you read that all. Um, uh, on top of this theoretical argument of unforgeable costliness, um, I decided a, a bit against my will, but <laughs> because the, there was so much demand to um, to model. Uh, altcoins with uh, stock to flow just to see if practically it would be possible to do it um, and uh, that's in fact one of the streams of research I'm, I'm working on right now with um, a, a team of uh, quants uh, and and I can tell you a little bit already what's uh, what's what the result is and I I, twit I tweeted a, a little bit about that as well uh, they all have very low r squareds so the models don't really fit very well for example litecoin which is very interesting because the halving is uh, is very soon litecoin has an r squared of 32 percent that's uh, versus uh, bitcoin 95 percent 32 is really low it 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 basically says there is no relationship there same with uh, ethereum uh, around 50% R squared. Um, coins like uh, DCR, D Decret, I don't know how you pronounce it properly, but 0% uh, R squared. So the theoretical argument of unforgeable costliness uh, already uh, makes you expect that it is not possible. But if you actually do the work and, and, and make the stock to flow models, the outcomes are, are not very good. So we'll, we'll publish. Um, an article about this in, in in a couple of weeks, and um, yeah, I'm I'm, I'm very um, interested in what the response will be. Excellent. I think it's it's really as many of us would have anticipated that basically the shit coins are not unforgeably costly, as you know Nick Zabo, Nick Zabo would say. And uh, it really, it brings to mind this idea, and I think Safety has touched on this as well, but if any of the listeners have read Julian Simon, The Ultimate Resource, and in that book, Julian talks about how really any resource that we've wanted in the world, if people dedicated enough human ingenuity, they could go and make more of it. But as Safety points out and other Bitcoiners point out, that that's, the, that's exactly why Bitcoin is so interesting and so exceptional precisely because of the difficulty adjustment making it more basically meaning making it so that you can't just go and make more uh, so yeah it's a very uh, interesting uh, point there so i think the other thing that everyone is trying to now understand is can the stock to flow multiple be used as some sort of Bitcoin peak and Bitcoin bottom price indicator. And the other interesting consideration is how it might change the game. Because if 
some traders and speculators are anticipating that other speculators are trading based on stock to flow modeling. You might have well changed the game here. Yeah, 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 yeah. I, I don't know, of course, but but uh, it's an interesting point. The, the stock to flow multiple. Um, before we dive into that, uh, let, let me say that um, the R squared that I that I mentioned in the article, and that um, I mentioned um, just in the in the podcast, it's it's not understood uh, by everybody. So so maybe I should talk a little bit about that. The R squared is a goodness of fit measure. So it it tells you how good the model. Uh, fits the data and an r squared of say below 50 or 60 percent is not very good it's bad it basically says there, there's not a fit uh, and a hundred percent r squared uh, it means that you have a perfect fit a perfect model and you almost never see that because you know it's a model it's not the reality there's always some noise that uh, disturbs it um, but so, so so the 95 percent of the stock to flow model is really really good and uh, yeah, it, it shows that the, uh, the relationship between stock to flow and value, um, well, the, the chance that that is caused by uh, by anything anything other than stock to flow is close to zero. And a lot a lot of people reject the stock to flow model because it doesn't take into account uh, things like demand or or, or uh, forks and hacks and economic news and all that. Um, but what would it add? It it would only add like five percent, the missing five percent. We already have ninety five percent good model. Um, so in my opinion, all those other factors, even demand, as as important as it is, um, all those other factors are noise, and stock to flow is the real signal that we keep. We have to keep focused on. Um, but still, and then we go to the stock to flow multiple. Still, it is interesting to see where the model is wrong. So uh, basically, the model error and stock to flow that is the real Bitcoin price divided by the model price, and sometimes the the model uh, the, the real price is uh, is higher than the model price. Sometimes it's lower. Um, now, ideally, in statistics, the error uh, should be white noise, like a random no pattern thing. But if we look at the stock to flow multiple. The error basically of the stock to flow model, then you see clear patterns, and um, we ca we can we can see what causes the lag uh, or the, the the error. And and one thing is the the lagged reaction to the halving. Uh, uh, so so when a halving um, uh, was there, after the halving, the price shoots up, so that the the model price goes uh, goes up a factor ten. Uh, but the price, of course, does not. So it, it lags behind, can be a couple of months, can be uh, can be a year. But that's what we saw the last two uh, two times. And um, and the other thing where the error is is not not it is on the other side, on the upside. If markets are in a bull uh, market and the uh, the all time highs, when people get really greedy, fear of missing out, the, the total madness is there. Then you see the market overshoot the stock to flow model. In 2011, it was 13x. In 2013, it was 10x. And uh, recently, in 2017, uh, the real price overshot uh, 3x. And yeah, it, it's it's really interesting to see that pattern because if you know that those two things, lagging the halving and, and uh, all-time highs, are what causes the error, it gives you even more uh, confidence in the model. Uh, and indeed, you could try to use it as a top and bottom indicator like the multi uh, the mayor uh, multiple where uh, uh, trace mayor uh, he looks at the difference between the 200 day moving average and the real price and then you see those spikes uh, when the price is really high above the 200 day moving average and you see the the, the dips when it's a good buy moment so to speak but yeah if, if you do that with the stock to flow multiple I, Put the charts out there. It, yeah, it turns out to be a very good uh, stock to bottom uh, or uh, top and bottom indicator. Maybe even better than uh, the mayor multiple. Because the thing I don't like about the mayor uh, multiple, um, as useful as it is, though, but is the the fact that, for example, in two thousand thirteen, there were there there were two 
uh, peaks in the mayor multiple. So you would have sold too early, probably at the first uh, peak when Bitcoin was a hundred dollars. Uh, and if you look at the stock to flow multiple, it only shows one peak in 2013. So there's, yeah, I think it's a little bit more accurate. But uh, well, I think the most important thing for myself of the stock to flow uh, multiple is that every single year since 2010 or nine, actually, every single year, Bitcoin was and below and above the stock to flow model. So a multiple of above one and below one in every single year. And that's yeah, sort of a that shows sort of a reversal to the model. Uh, and 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 yeah, I think it means that you can use the model as a sort of compass that it always uh, returns to. So are you referring there that that's like reversion to the mean? Uh, yeah, where mean then is the uh, stock to flow model in this case. Yeah, that's that's that's. And I also think that's when the you know it's it it's a model, and I I wrote it in the uh, in the article. I think it's a hypothesis. Uh, it can be wrong, and and I, I really should should say that it, it's uh, it's based on historic data. It's it's uh, uh, very well a back test, of of course, but it, still, it's it's the big test is the future, uh, the next halving, and um, I think I can say that if we don't go above the fifty uh, k, the fifty thousand dollars that the model predicts after the halving then um the model uh, it, it will break down uh, i don't expect it i expect it to go there because it it did so every single year um but that's a that's the big test interesting and the other point there is that as the years have gone on the number at the top right the multiple has come down a little bit correct so as you're saying in 2011 it was something like 13 and then you know in 2017 it sort of went maybe three and a bit times so who's to say whether the next time if we do have another big big bull run whether the next one will be at like say 3x or even 2x like just a bit less it because I could sort of see an argument both ways there, right? Because some people might say, well, more of the world are waking up to Bitcoin. People might actually start putting serious sums of money into it. Yeah, yeah. I've been um, getting my, wrapping my, my head around this one. I, a lot of questions about it as well. I don't know, frankly. Uh, yeah, there is a pattern. Um, it goes down 13x, 10x, 3x, maybe it's 2x next time. But then again, it's a. Uh, it's a very, uh, yeah, it's a power law distribution. So it's, it's a very nonlinear market. You get big moves that are not outliers. They're, they're really structural uh, in this kind of distribution. So I would also not be expected if we see another 10x uh, move again. So um, yeah, it, 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 that should be a warning as well because you can, you can use the multiple as a... Uh, as a timer, timer of, of bottoms and, and, and tops, but you can be very wrong with it as well. So be be very careful uh, to uh, to use it with actual money. <laughs> I think that's a good piece of advice for the listeners. Next point, and I think this is really just the this is the question as we record this now in early July, first of July, and the price now as we record this is a little bit below eleven thousand USD. The question then is. Are we front running the halvening model? Yeah, yeah. I, I uh, started using that term uh, front running, and it's it's uh, it certainly looks like it. But but it, it, again, if we if we look at the theoretical argument, um, in this case, uh, efficient market uh, hypothesis, uh, it should be priced in, of course. So everybody knows the halving is there. It's public information, and uh, uh, yeah, if it has an effect. The most, the the best way of reasoning would be it's priced in, right now. On the other hand, um, if we look at the stock to flow model, we know that now that the price after the halving should be around uh, fifty thousand dollars. So, the current price, uh, and especially the price uh, at the time of the uh, the article that was fourth, a little under. 
four thousand dollars is is like like way off and way below that number. So if people believe in the model, like I do, but but I know there's more. But if if people believe in it, it it doesn't have to be everybody. But if if a handful or a couple of handfuls of, of big investors believe in the money. Uh, in in the model and put money uh, on it and start buying, then of course it could be that um, the halvening is front run this time. Um, and I should add that that wasn't the case last two times, right? In two thousand twelve, we saw uh, I think it was a hundred x directly uh, after the after the November uh, two thousand twelve halving. It was certainly not uh, not priced in, and I can imagine because it was the first one, and there was a lot of talk about the death spiral and how miners, uh, their, their their reward is uh, is halved as well. How they would stop mining, and that would lead to a death spiral. So there was a lot of fear. It was a bad thing, the halving. Uh, um, and and then if we look at two thousand sixteen, we had one halving before. People had learned, but on the other hand. Um, the price lagged the the, the June uh, 2016 halving uh, enormously, like 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 a year or something. Uh, it, it took the price to to catch up with the theoretical stock to flow uh, uh, value, and uh, yeah, maybe that was because because it was also the time that that the altcoins uh, became popular, Ethereum, of course, uh, and that might have taken some of the uh, the money away. Um, so so yeah, what what happens in two thousand twenty? The 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 if you look historically, the big uh, uh, bull run will be after the halving, so somewhere in two thousand twenty one, uh, you could say. Uh, but but now you have this 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 stock to flow model, and if you believe in it, if you believe uh, Bitcoin will be uh, above fifty thousand uh, dollars, why should you wait? What <laughs> Why should you wait till that happens? Till you're in the middle, till it's twenty thousand or thirty? It's a it's a psychological thing, and uh, so yeah, I I don't know. I, I think it's very remarkable that we um, that we have seen this this almost three uh, x since uh, uh, the publication and the podcast uh, we did. I certainly don't want to attribute that to the uh, stock to flow uh, model 100% i mean there there is there is all sorts of other things like the eternal quantitative easing that was uh, uh, that was uh, started and the trade war with with china and the coming recession with the inverted yield curves all good things for for bitcoin so so it could be that as well uh, but it certainly is interesting to see this big rise this 3x rise already uh, since the bottom uh, towards the the the, the fifty thousand um, uh, model price. <laughs> so uh, you know we're not saying uh, it was that your work that did it, Plan B, but you know we are three x higher. So you know we, who knows, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and if you think um, if you can, you think it about the next halvings as well, how far if there's front running, how far could it go? Uh, say you believe the you, you really strongly in the model. Um, I put this this table out uh, somewhere in the in the tweet. So uh, it, it's very rough numbers, of course. Uh, I like to argue orders of magnitudes and not 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 uh, very precise numbers. But uh, so the model predicts fifty thousand after twenty twenty halving, but four hundred thousand after twenty twenty four halving, and even. Three million after the 2028 halving, and you know if if that becomes sort of truth, yeah, it 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 needs people to believe in it, but and and it, it needs to be fundamentally true. We don't know that again. It's 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 an hypothesis, and the proof is in the in the in the pudding. But if that were true, and and you would front run it. Then you wouldn't only front run the 2020 halving. I have a lot of discussions about uh, about this with the people that are even more bullish than I am. Um, that that I am underestimating uh, <laughs> the, the the future <laughs> price. So that's very funny because usually I'm 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 overestimating if you if you compare it to the uh, uh, 
logarithmic uh, regressions out there, I, my, my model prices are a lot higher. But there are people who are even more bullish. They say, okay, it's, 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 it's going to front run every halving. And in a way, that's true. I mean, if, you, if there's only 10% of the people that believe the 3 million number in 2028, then the theoretical price would be 10% of 3 million is 300K right now. Which of course it isn't, but it's it's very it's it's mind boggling thing this front running. But like, I, yeah, it's it's just also a bit of a warning that look, the the market was lagging the halvings last two times, but it's not necessarily the same this time. It could be front running it because a lot of people learn about the halving. We have the stock to flow model, and well, um, very interesting. We shall uh, we shall see. <laughs> Yeah, it's fascinating stuff. And this table that you've got, so you're saying, so just for the listeners, uh, it's showing the year, the halving, and then the model predicted price. So as you said, 50,000, uh, 400,000, and then 3.2 million for the 2028 uh, halving. Now, to the extent that stock to flow modeling works, so again, caveat, this is not economic law, it's some sort of modeling, uh, but to the extent that the modeling works, do you have any reflections on how many cycles we could anticipate this working for? Yeah, that, that's also a discussion on, on Twitter. Lots of questions about exactly this 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 uh, uh, infinite value, if you wish. You know that uh, if you if you follow the table, we could go all the way to twenty one forty when the flow is zero, when there's no more new bitcoins, only fees, and uh, the, the the theoretical value out of the stock to flow model would be infinite. So how can that be? And basically, I think this is a very theoretical argument. Uh, and I'm a very practical guy. So um, if I look at the next three halvings alone, so we're now at a, at a say, 100, $200 billion uh, market. Every halving, this, this market goes 10x. So after 2020, we go to 1 trillion. After 24, we go to 10 trillion. And after 28, so the third halving, uh, we go to 100 trillion US dollars. Hence my name, uh, my, my Twitter handle. Uh, I think that that we don't have to wait till, till 2140 before the model breaks or b before something breaks. I think we'll, we'll be there sooner than we think. I think we'll be there well, maybe 24, somewhere between 24 and 2028, 20, because a 10 to $100 trillion Bitcoin market, that's enormous if you compare it to, to the US dollar, for example. It has a monetary base uh, of, of 3 trillion, and I think an M2 of about 12 or 14 trillion. So then that means that somewhere between 2024 and 2028, 20, Bitcoin is bigger than the US dollar. It basically means uh, the U.S. dollar will will die, and and we'll be uh, measuring things in in Bitcoin, and yeah, <laughs> very bullish. Yeah, yeah, well, yeah, and and uh, you know the model it measures Bitcoin in dollars, and it uh, it measures uh, gold and silver, etc., in dollars. But if Bitcoin is bigger than the than the dollar, um, then we measure things in in Bitcoin. It will be the uh, unit of account. And uh, yeah, we maybe we measure the dollar in bitcoins then it, instead of Bitcoin in dollars. Uh, it, it, it really is, is exactly that. I have this, this other chart that I get a lot of discussion about that one. Uh, it was one of my first charts that I ever put out there. It, it, it um, compares the price of Bitcoin of the last 10 years with Weimar Germany, the hyperinflation, where the German mark, the paper mark goes like, a trillion times the uh, the original value. It, it, they keep adding zeros, and it's like like Zimbabwe and Venezuela. Uh, but if you look at how closely the Bitcoin price tracks this this, or the dollar price, if you will, the dollar Bitcoin price tracks this this German uh, uh, mark price, it's it's amazing, and it gives you an historical example of what might happen. It's a again, it's it, what might happen. It's not an expectation, but it's a, a possible scenario, maybe with not too much uh, probability, but it certainly 
looks like it gives you an, a view about how hyper bitcoinization so that's that's how we call this this uh, this uh, moment in time when, when bitcoin um, starts to overtake the dollar and everything is priced in bitcoin that's how it could look like and yeah maybe I'd think about how beautiful that might be that's that's yeah it, it, today we build our economies on 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 the dollar and the euro and the yen and central banks are are, are producing that that th those coins like like crazy, especially right now with uh, quantitative easing. So it's a bit like we're building an economy like an architect building in a house with uh, a meter that is changing or or uh, an inch that is changing every day. Imagine how that how that house would look like, and that's our economy at the moment. If we have Bitcoin, and nobody can can touch the supply, it will be a metric. Um, as stable as a meter or an inch or or a temperature measure like the uh, Fahrenheit, and imagine what what kind of uh, economy and and society we can build on that. It it will bring us the next uh, Renaissance. I I really believe that, and that's 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 basically why I'm I'm in this space uh, working on Bitcoin. Fantastic. Yeah, look, I think I'm uh, very much agreed about the whole Renaissance idea. I think many Bitcoin bulls are aligned with you on that point. Uh, although I would say we have to be careful about considering it as a, a set meter because, yes, you know, the amount of Bitcoins is only 21 million and so on. I think from the Austrian school, they would think of this like there can be no such thing as neutral money, you know, and so they would think of it like, well, your desire to even hold a cash balance can vary and that in turn can also vary uh, the value or the purchasing power, the real purchasing power of the Bitcoins or in sats as we probably will be denominating. Uh, but I think on the whole, it will be a much more uh, better society and much more you know, free market world that we would be living in. And I think I really like the point you're making around how the US dollar is changing too, because it's difficult then to model because over time, the US dollar is coming down in value as well. So how much of that is kind of, uh, maybe it's a bit silly to think of it this way, but it's like how much of that is Bitcoin go on, going up versus how much of that is just the US dollar going down? Yeah, absolutely. That's a very good point. Because if you look at an, at the Weimar um, period, the hyperinflation in Germany around uh, 1923, I read a lot about this period. Uh, living in Holland next to Germany, it's <laughs> maybe uh, something that, that, that 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 is very uh, alive and, and actual, but so I read a lot. There's there's one book. It's called When Money Dies. It's it's written by Ferguson. If if people like to read it, it's it's really good read, and it talks about this period uh, from a, a diary perspective of people actually living in this period, and it's exactly this point that you make, uh, Stefan. That those people in Germany thought that. Uh, not that their their own coin was going down, that the Ger the German mark was going down. They thought that the uh, pound and the, the the French franc at that time, uh, they all went up, and because they were after the the First uh, World War, um, uh, repaying all their debts, and um, they thought the whole world was advancing uh, and and going up, and they were well stable. But that's what the other the. the but it was the other way around, of course. They were printing money. Their currency was going to 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 zero, uh, <laughs> and, uh, but they didn't. It didn't feel like that. And it could be. It could be uh, the same now that 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 we think uh, uh, the stock market is going up and all the housing prices are going up and and uh, well, inflation is, is is not there yet. But you certainly see it in in all the assets. We can call it asset inflation, maybe. Uh, this time around, uh, but but we are thinking all oh, those things go up, where in fact it could be that our currency is uh, going to zero. <laughs> uh, very interesting. And Plan B, I'm very interested as well to discuss. Uh, so you were posting some charts showing this idea of Bitcoin's path plus commodities on a pathway to thirty trillion. So can you outline what's going on there? Yes. Uh, Actually, that that's one of the most interesting uh, questions and critiques I got on the, on the model, on the stock to flow model. It, it overall, I I got really less critique and comments than I expected, and, and maybe hoped for 
so may, maybe that means the model is good or maybe people uh, uh, don't mention it or don't want to mention it. But but there was one critique that is very, very uh, important and, and uh, I uh, urge everyone using this model to really take this serious as well, especially if you invest on the model. Um, and this critique is, okay, you have a correlation of 95% R squared, but correlation is not causation. How do you know it's not a spurious regression? And in econometric terms, you could say uh, the variables, stock to flow and market value are non-stationary. Uh, they both go up. So stock to flow, of course, only goes up. And value, at least last last 10 years, it only goes up. And if you regress those, if you if you model the one with the other, then uh, yeah, of course you get an, a very nice correlation and a very high 95% uh, R squared. But you could also do that with the global beer consumption, right? It, that goes up as well. So that, I bet right. you there will be a very nice correlation between the, the uh, rising global beer consumption and the rising Bitcoin price. But that correlation will be totally spurious and, and not hold for the future uh, per, per se. Uh, so, so how can you tell it's not a spurious regression? Now, I have um, a lot of uh, quants commenting on this modeling on this you know i put all the data and the models out in github so they're they're using those and uh we're with an international quant team at the moment making this robust and and and, and looking if it's spurious regressions and, and doing all the formal tests uh, to see if it's if it's okay or not but even then it's always a thing to you, you don't know 100 percent sure so um that was the reason i decided to look at totally unrelated commodity markets. They have nothing uh, to do with Bitcoin. And uh, they use, a, especially the gold market, they use stock to flow measure. Uh, it, it's actually, uh, I learned the stock to flow measure from uh, from the commodity markets and from uh, Seyfedean uh, Amus's book, the, the, the Bitcoin standard, must read. Uh, so I thought that would be a very nice market to look at. So I looked at gold, I looked at silver, diamonds, platina, platinum, and, and palladium. Totally different markets, all different uh, stock to flows, and all different values. And, and when I uh, made a model, a stock to flow model on those different markets, I was, I was shocked, really, to find an R squared of 99.5%. So basically 100%. A... a it blew my mind, and and of course it's 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 only five data points, right? It's it's not much, but um, that's the same with uh, Kepler and his his uh, third law with the planets orbiting the Earth and, and distance to the Earth. They have a power law. He had only like five planets, and, and a ninety nine point five percent correlation. But it's yeah. So so I, I really take this serious that the stock to flow measure is also working on a totally unrelated markets from Bitcoin, um, gold, silver, palladium, platina, and uh, and diamonds, and gives this high R squared. Those markets are not serially uh, correlated. There is, it's, it's stationary. So there's no problems that, that we have with, with looking at Bitcoin. And uh, it gives me extra confidence uh, in, in the model. And what's, what's even more uh, interesting is that both models, and that's also the, the chart, what the chart is showing, both models point towards one point where a stock, an asset with a stock to flow of 100 uh, and, a, and a value of, a market value of 30 trillion US dollars uh, will be. Uh, so Bitcoin is growing towards that point uh, when, when it reaches stock to flow of 100. And the market, the total uh, commodities market, um, uh, points to uh, an asset like that as well. So I find that really remarkable. Um, well, we ha we have to see uh, if it really happens because we have never seen uh, an asset with a stock to flow of 100 before. So we also don't know how it should be valued. And uh, um, it's also interesting to see that, that um, we don't have a model for Bitcoin for valuation, 
well, stock to flow model is, is, is an, an approach, but we also don't have a formal model for gold valuation. It's really interesting. I, I, yeah, th there is no cash flow. There is nothing to model. So how, how is gold valued? It, it, it really is without a fundamental model. And um, there, there was one other thing I uh, discovered during this exercise uh, in the, into the commodity markets. Uh, and that was that uh, uh, silver was um, uh, uh, silver stock was di disappearing fast, and and in fact that I had the wrong silver data in my uh, my first article. Um, one of my followers uh, mentioned it. He said, "Okay, the silver stock is uh, way less than than you uh, report." So I uh, I researched it, and and the data I had in the article before was from Wikipedia. Wikipedia. And it turned out to be uh, including below ground silver, so it was way too high. Uh, so in the end, I, I, I now have a better silver source uh, data source. It's the Silver Institute with way lower lower stock and way lower stock to flow as well. So stock to flow of silver is not twenty two that you see reported at at several uh, locations, uh, by the way, but it's three, only three. That that's a shocker. That's basically means that the monetary value of silver has disappeared uh, in the last hundred years, and that's yeah, that's one of the things uh, that silver finding, but also the uh, stock to flow model for for all the other commodities. That's one of the things that got great interest from the gold community and the the commodity community. It's 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 really a different community than the Bitcoin community. Um, by the way, I, I talk a lot with uh, Willem Middelkoop. I, I, I guess you, uh, you, would, you would say Middelkoop in, in English. He is a well-known Dutch uh, commodities expert and investor. And he, he, he teaches me a lot about, about gold and silver and, and the community there because I'm not in the, uh, in the commodities uh, community. So he has a fund and, and written a lot of books and I learned really uh, a lot about it. Uh, and one of the very hopeful things I see is that the gold and the Bitcoin community are growing uh, towards each other a, a little bit. So there is a part of the gold community. I think Peter Schiff, Schiff is in that. That is really against Bitcoin. But there is also a part in the in the gold and silver community that really sees gold and e-gold Bitcoin as a hot combi uh, for the future. Um, so so also companies like uh, who, uh I, I like the in gold we trust report from uh incrementum, incrementum? In, yeah yeah it's incrementum in there. it's a, it's a team from uh, Liechtenstein in europe and uh I, I i read it for years but they're now for the first time having a par paragraph in their bitcoin and gold as a very nice uh combination uh for having in a fund so that's Really, something to watch. I think we'll we'll see more of that. It's a logical thing, especially with the uh, stock to flow uh, model showing, you know, gold as a physical uh, asset and, and Bitcoin as a digital asset, both high stock to flow, high value. Yeah, it's it's very interesting. So yeah, again, maybe to wrap it this this one up, um, the stock to flow model on on commodities gives me extra confidence in the stock to flow model uh, on bitcoin because it doesn't have this spurious regression problems and uh, yeah and both uh, point towards a 30 trillion dollar market which is yeah it is it's almost unbelievable <laughs> at this price point <laughs> very interesting and i guess just to summarize for the listeners as well so looking at your table plan b uh, the stock to flow ratio predicted for bitcoin is at the 2020 halving it'll be a ratio of 50 and at 2024 it'll be 100 and then at 2028 it'll be incredibly 200 so really once we get beyond gold it's just uncharted waters correct we're like we've never seen anything that scarce Absolutely, uncharted waters was uh, yeah it, for sure, and and very interesting to uh, to live in these times. Excellent. All right, so I, I also wanted to touch on uh, some of Tour de Mister's comments. Now, I actually had the chance to meet Tour de Mister at uh, Bitcoin San Francisco 2019, um, and now he uh, had some uh, comments around the uh, halvening and how 
potentially it might not be as convincing from his point of view. So maybe I'll just quickly summarize some of his points. I think some of them you've already touched on, but you can just sort of go through your discussion on that as well. So firstly, he was talking about, well, how do we define the stock in Bitcoin? How do we know how many coins have been lost? Because the estimates vary between one to four million. Uh, Point two was Bitcoin's production is trending towards zero. Does that mean its value should trend to infinity? And plan B, I think you've already touched on that. Number three, uh, the stock to flow estimates for gold and silver are a little bit debatable. I think you might have touched on that as well. And then fourth was just around the theory behind the date and how does the predefined low production value somehow create or production rate somehow create value. And the question he asks is if he created a new coin with an even lower emission rate than Bitcoin, could it theoretically have an even more, you know, even higher value? So plan B, do you have any thoughts on some of the tour's comments there? Yeah, first of all, it's it's great to get feedback, and especially from guys like like Tour who are in the space uh, for uh, almost from the beginning. So, uh, and, and that's also why I put everything on on Twitter and GitHub to get the feedback to learn. Um, so, yeah, I appreciate his his uh, four uh, concerns very much, and and let's go through them. Um, um, yeah, the lost coins. Um, th- that is a, a question that's asked more. How does that impact the uh, the stock? It does, of course. Uh, and how does that impact the stock to flow model and maybe your prediction? Uh, so I did the analysis. Uh, I implemented four different ways of adjusting for lost coins. The original way was to just ignore the first million uh, coins, the so-called Satoshi coins. We don't know, of course, if those were Satoshi coins, but but that's that's the narrative and. Well, those coins haven't moved, so so let's let's um, uh, do as if they are lost. Uh, so that's one one approach. Then I did the uh, no adjustment approach. So inc- leave those one million in there. Um, I did a gradual loss scenario. So where uh, so there's about four million lost coins around 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 now, two thousand nineteen. So that's about, what is it, uh, 30-something percent. Uh, what if every year there is uh, 30% uh, of coins uh, lost and, and make that gradually over time? And I combined the two in a fourth scenario. So for first 1 million lost and then a lower percentage lost every year. And then look what that did with the stock-to-flow analysis. And basically, there was no impact. So it it, uh, it changed the parameters, of course, a little bit. Uh, but the outcome was the same. And the R squared was basically the same, all above 92, 90, uh, 95 in, the, in that area. So I think lost coins is not so much a problem. But I do understand the question very much. Uh, I think we can, we can uh, safely... Uh, sleep on that on that concern sure so yeah let's go on to the second one the the second one was okay uh, gold and silver uh, um, numbers are debatable well that's true i mean uh, my silver numbers were wrong so um uh, i i adjusted those and uh, but but let's debate it so he he didn't really uh, mention why they were debatable, or or show me has um, uh, didn't show me his numbers, but I'd like to learn. So if there's somebody out there that has better numbers, better sources, I also asked that in the in the, in the tweets. Please uh, share them with us and, and make this more robust. Um, but on the other hand, uh, gold and silver sources that I have at the moment. So the Incrementum uh, report and the Silver Institute data and, and uh, same with Palladium and, and Platina. I think it's 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 not, it, those numbers are not very much debated in, in commodity cycles, uh, uh, circles. Uh, so we could double check it, but um, yeah, I don't know. It's, it's um, I think those are pretty, pretty okay, but I'd like to hear more about why Tour thinks uh, they, they they could be wrong, or or if he has different numbers, let's uh, let's indeed debate this. Uh, what one thing to add is the gold and silver numbers are not the model itself. So they're basically apart from the Bitcoin stock to flow model. They're just uh, an extra check on 
whether it's a, a spurious re regression or not. So they e even if those numbers were totally wrong and the whole stock to flow model on gold and sil silver is not there and etc., that that says nothing about the Bitcoin stock to flow uh, model. It just stands there as it is. It's made from data. So so uh, yeah, I, I think we could uh, put that to sleep as well. Sure. All right. Um, yeah, no, I, th I think there's nothing else I can think of on that. Uh, and uh, I think so you already touched on the second one, which is about uh, is, you know, Bitcoin, you know, does the value trend to infinity. And I think basically it's similar to the hyperinflation point we we're talking about. Um, so let's go on to the fourth one, which is around if, you know, if, so, if someone were to hypothetically create a new coin with a lower emission rate than BTC, then why wouldn't that coin you know, also have really high value? Yeah, yeah, I like that question the most, <laughs> and uh, that concern. And uh, I actually have, have thought of this as well. What what if we create a better Bitcoin, next Bitcoin, with even uh, scarcer uh, or, or stricter money supply, or, or or no money supply at all? Uh, how how would that go? But then, <laughs> then of course, you uh, you run into a lot of other uh, uh, problems um, because this this new coin should at, at least be as expensive to mine and as decentralized as, as Bitcoin at the moment is. So um, a coin without a proof of work wouldn't work. Uh, uh, a a pre-mined go is an, uh, um, pre -mined coin like, like Ripple is a no-go because who gets the coins? How is it distributed? Uh, a, 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 a coin without the peer-to-peer -peer network that, that uh, Bitcoin has at the moment would not be decentralized and would have a central party, me or Tur or whoever makes this coin, um, deciding over uh, over the supply, and then hash rate. So you need you need the security and and the miners. You, you need to attract miners um, to make uh, ASICs uh, hardware and 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 uh, spend all the electricity costs to to yeah to 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 make this this high uh, high hash rate. So basically, you need to do everything right in a new coin, like Bitcoin did. All the network effects that Trace Mayer talks about, all the seven network effects need to be there. You need to have miners, speculators, uh, investors, and, and developers. And even if you could pull, pull all that off with a, a lower uh, supply, um, then... A slow introduction of coins, so not a pre-mine, that, because that's a, a no-go, but a slow creation takes time. And Bitcoin has already a 10 years head start. So maybe theoretically it could be done, but in practice, I think there will never be a next and better Bitcoin, in, in my opinion. Uh, yeah, I don't think I could have said it better. Essentially, I th I, I'm with you there. I think it's... An interesting thought experiment, but I think in practice you, it just would not be achievable for those reasons, right? You would not have uh, the next, you know, the so-called next Bitcoin having the same level of decentralization, the same level of uh, spreading out of the supply as well, right? Enough people now sort of hold Bitcoin that they wouldn't necessarily all just jump over to the quote-unquote next Bitcoin. And I think that, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think there may have been one or two of, of the folk fork coins or altcoins who tried to do something like this and then they failed probably for these reasons that we are discussing uh, but it's an interesting question even if uh, i think the answer in the end is still no it can't be done plan b i'm also interested to talk about another graph which you showed and it's talking about this idea of uh, well you were talking a little bit about random walk down wall street and in this graph you show a very interesting allocation because in this chart you show 1% bitcoin and 99% cash versus actually just you know holding other things like UST, UST bonds 10 year um or gold or the S&P 500 can you just outline for the listeners what's going on there yes um the the, the random walk down wall street title is of course uh, from from the famous book random Walk Down Wall Street from uh, Malkiel. Uh, it talks about volatility, risk return, efficient market. It's it's really a must read. Uh, I, I highly recommend it. And I use this this chart to show that Bitcoin is a really strange thing if you look at it from a financial point of view, and especially the high volatility uh, thing. Because if you 
read about Bitcoin in the mainstream media uh, mainly, but also in Bitcoin cycles, uh, there's a lot of talk about the high volatility, the high risk that, oh yeah, Bitcoin goes uh, minus 80%. And, and, and basically it, it does that every couple of years, right? It's, it, it has done it three times before, minus 80%. So that's a lot of risk for most, in fact, too much risk, uh, in fact, for most investors. And the reason you're not looking any further. Um, however, risk is not necessarily a bad thing. It, can, it is the source of income as well. If you don't have risk, so no risk, no return is, is what we uh, say as uh, investors. Um, and also the other way around. If you, have a, if you see something with high uh, return, there should be high risk, a high uh, um, a loss uh, uh, percentage. So um, in the end, it's all about not only volatility and risk, but also return. You have to look at risk return. And that's what this chart is showing. It shows risk on the X axis and return on the I, uh, the Y axis. It's a classic uh, thing. And it shows the typical uh, investments like stocks indeed. Stocks have a, if you look at the last 50 years on average without dividends, have a, an average return. It's a geometric return, by the way, uh, of 8%. Um, and and some worse, some very bad years like 2008 or 2001, where uh, stocks have a drawdown uh, uh, of, of a really bad loss of 40%. So stocks drop 40% one, once in a while, but you get 8% return. Uh, gold is a little less risky. It uh, it can go down 30% in a year, so that's less than than stocks. Uh, but it, it will earn you less return as well. It has a 7.5% return and even less risk and return is uh, treasury bonds because treasury bonds, yeah, right now the interest is, is really low, but on average last 50 years, it, it, it'll give you 6% return and only 8% uh, max animal, annual uh, loss. And if you plot... so so. The, the nice thing is all those investment classic investments they they they're on a line a straight line i i i put this in this chart and the numbers can be a little bit different but it's a general idea uh, it, they're on a straight line so you can earn more return but you need to uh, take more risk that's what what this is basically saying you can go to stocks but then uh, you need to uh, be uh, willing to accept a 40% uh a loss because that can happen now if you put bitcoin in there it's it's really crazy it's first of all it's not on the line so it's 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 above the the, the line from stocks and gold and, uh, and u.s treasury bonds it it shows a um a very uh oh, oh i'm sorry I, I take one step back um if we put Bitcoin on this chart, it would be off the charts, right? It would be very high volatility, twice the volatility of, of stocks, 80% uh, maximum loss in a year. And uh, return would also be off the charts because it would not be 6, 7, 8%. It would be on average last 10 years, it would be 200%. So um, what I did in this chart was, okay, you can... Um, uh, reduce uh, if something is very volatile has a lot of risk you can reduce the exposure to that investment you can size your downsize your investment and i downs downsized it all the way to one percent so one percent bitcoin and 99 percent cash basically doing nothing earning zero return zero risk so it's 99 percent doing nothing only one percent of your investment in bitcoin and if you put that in the chart, it it still is off the chart. It's above the line. It's it's uh, so the maximum loss if you only put one percent of your money in is of course one percent. Uh, that's the risk. Um, but the return is still eight point three percent over last uh, ten years. So it's 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 no guarantee it will be the same the the, the next ten years. But last ten years, it was eight point three percent. So you get more return and less risk than stocks. Um, and that that's the whole thing I wanted to show in this 
in this chart. Basically two things. One, high volatility is not a problem. You can size your investment. Just reduce your investment and you have lower risk. And you'll see with Bitcoin that it still has a very high return. Um, if you, there's a technical term for this. It's called the sharp ratio where they divide return by the risk. And basically, or, or, or officially, the risk is measured as a standard deviation, but I like to use the drawdown, so that's even bigger risk. It's the maximum risk in a year, not the standard deviation. Uh, but what you see with all the traditional investments, like stocks, is that the risk, so the maximum loss, is higher than the return. So for stocks, the return was 8%, the risk 40%. If you divide 8 by 40, you get the sharp ratio, and it's lower than 1. With Bitcoin, it's the other way around. The return is 200%, the risk is 80%. So the sharp ratio of this asset seems to be larger than 1. And that is, yeah, that that is... Phenomenal, really, right? That's phenomenal, right? Exactly. And... Um, uh, there's all sorts of uh, technical things, uh, mathematical things you can do with distributions like like uh, like Bitcoin's distribution, and uh, maybe it's too te too technical for now. But but I'll just like to mention uh, the barbell strategy uh, of uh, Nicholas Taleb, uh, especially in environments uh, where there are fat tails in extremism, um, uh, in, in his words. Uh, like Bitcoin, right? Fat tails, maybe there's a power law distribution here. That's that's what I think. Especially in those environments, it makes sense to, to have a barbell strategy. And that means to have a, uh, not like an average spread at portfolio, but to have some very uh, volatile, risky uh, investments and some very low uh, risk investments. So basically my 1% Bitcoin and 99% cash uh, portfolio would be an extreme barbell uh, uh, investment, and those are those work very good in 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 fat tail uh, en environments, um, and that's what what this this chart shows. It's, I, I think it's very very encouraging. It needs a lot more work, but it's yeah. I I know there's a lot of traction in the financial community. If I, if I show this chart, the jaws drop, and and discussion is guaranteed. Fantastic, and. It's really a reflection that maybe we really do live in extremistan. <laughs> and yeah. uh, just to clarify as well, with that 1%, is that annual rebalancing? So let's say your Bitcoin went up. Would you now sell and rebalance into cash? Yes. Yeah, I forgot to say that. Yeah, it's it's a yearly rebalancing and it's a very crude model. A yearly rebalance at the end of year, December close uh, price. Excellent. And so then really the big question is, what happens when the rest of the world wake up to that strategy? Yeah, in fact, I think it can be the basis uh, for a very nice uh, arbitrage uh, strategy between the fiat and the Bitcoin uh, world. I'm, I'm working day and night on that. I think I'm very close, especially in this negative interest uh, environment. It's, it's, it's crazy. Um, but but yeah, you can do very nice mathematical things with this. And, and in the end, I think this will lead to um, to, to something that, that will be amazing or, or hard to ignore. Uh, maybe one thing I, I can point out, out already, and that's the futures market. Um, if you look at the futures market right now, and there's of course uh, the CME, uh, it's a big big futures market in in Chicago. But soon there will be bucked, uh, physically settled uh, futures in New York, which is which is great. Uh, but if we look at the futures market right now, it's in contango. It's it's and that means that the future price of Bitcoin is higher than the spot price, the current price of of Bitcoin. And it's about the last couple of months. Uh, it was about. Uh, it it varies, of course, but it was about one percent on average uh, higher the next month. So the the we're in July now. The August uh, Bitcoin price would be uh, future price would be one percent higher than the spot price. That that makes possible uh, a cash and carry strategy where you buy a Bitcoin um, and sell it 
the same time you buy it and you sell it uh, future sell it for one percent more and that means that you have a guaranteed one percent return on your investment in a month so you could do that 12 months in a row and make a little a little over 12 percent per year which is really really good especially if it's because it's it's risk-free basically you cannot earn more but you also cannot uh, earn earn less because you have the the asset and you future sell it so there's no risk involved 12 percent at the current uh future market conditions which is amazing from a institutional investor point of view excellent so really it's just they would be taking only the I guess the custodial risk or kind of delivery risk from the uh, CME, and that's not very high risk, is it? Yeah, yeah right, right. And 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 uh, with bucked, uh, it will be uh, it will be physically settled. So it's, it's, it will be great to see when they launch. It's the twenty two twenty second of July, I think. Um, when they launch, what what those uh, prices will look like, and what the CME prices will will do, because. Uh, the good thing about a physically settled uh, futures market next to a, a cash settled futures market like the CME is that, that you, you can't have shenanigans anymore. They can't play tricks. If if uh, one market is, for example, the cash market is manipulated, you can easily arbitrage that away with the uh, the physical uh, settled uh, uh, market. So they, the price on those markets should not vary very much and it will be very very interesting to see what those are and if the market the natural uh, bitcoin future market would be a contango market then oh this 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 would open a, a door to to very nice risk returns for the ones that uh, that are forward thinking and um and able to uh, to implement those strategies so actually i'm curious then do you have any views on which specific investors could actually undertake such a strategy or whether maybe their policies or their governance might restrain them from undertaking such a strategy? I mean, a quick example, maybe pensions or endowment funds or family office. Would these sort of uh, institutional kind of investment vehicles, might they have certain restraints placed upon what they can invest in and how they can undertake that strategy? Yeah, that is a very good question, and 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 also one that I struggle with uh, every day as a, as an institutional investor. Um, so I talk about Bitcoin uh, in our company, of course, but I guess it will be very difficult for a big insurance company or a big bank uh, to put Bitcoin on their balance sheet because of regulation and and uh, central bank regulation. Um, I think we, the discussion has to be started, and and especially in Holland, the, the central bank is very liberal, as in they're open to discussions about blockchain and Bitcoin, and and they're, I think that. But in the end, it th- th- those companies are investing the money of pensioners, of of uh, savers, so so they should they should have really good risk management and, and capital management and, and low risk investment uh, uh, strategy. So Bitcoin is not the first thing that comes in mind and that that, that would be very difficult to uh, to put capital charges in the sense of uh, basal uh, or, or solvency or uh, uh, against. So so those are not in my mind the logical first adapters. Uh, first invest big institutional investors in uh, in bitcoin on the other hand uh, funds that are investing for the risk of uh, the uh, fund holder the, the participation holders uh, especially hedge funds uh, above a certain um, investment that are not regulated those are um, in a in a in a much better position to add bitcoin to their balance sheet and uh, I'm especially looking at, for example, commodity funds. Funds. So, so that's why I'm so, uh, so happy to be um, learning about the commodities market right now and and, and making some contacts there, because uh, because those funds would be could easily rotate a little bit out of 
gold or silver or whatever and a little bit into uh, Bitcoin and s yeah, still be within our mandate and, and uh, it would be a logical fit. Also, I see, I, I talk to a lot of people, get a lot of uh, response and I see a lot of family offices. So uh, either billionaires, uh, rich families, high net worth individuals, they can do, of course, it's their money. They can do with it uh, what they want. And they see it as a, well, an interesting, Bitcoin as an, as an interesting new um, investment, but also as a hedge uh, vehicle. So what if this whole negative interest rate, printing of money, quantitative easing thing is not uh, going according to plan and, and we have some, well, uh, hyperinflation or even Bitcoinization kind of scenario. What if I just bought like 0.1 or 2% of my portfolio into uh, into Bitcoin and, and even more? Uh, and I see that I see that as a very yeah possible scenario for the future. Excellent. It reminds me of I mean we've been we've been talking about front running the Bitcoin halvening, but maybe certain institutions will be better able to maneuver themselves and position themselves to actually you know use this information and buy some Bitcoin. Yeah, uh, yeah, absolutely. And, and of course, I'm working. Uh, it would be my dream to to be a bridge uh, between the Bitcoin and the, and the institutional investor world. As a matter of fact, I I think I'm perfectly. Uh, um, uh, situated for that with my background and the position I have at the moment, uh, but I, I again I think it's a long way, and and uh, but but if I learned one thing is that uh, from from the last month and all the comments and, and talks I had is that the institutional investors, the the pensions and the, and the banks might not be in uh, or, or or in 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 Bitcoin or invested in Bitcoin, but their quant teams certainly are. They they are not all, but but let's say twenty five fifty percent. They heard of Bitcoin, they have Bitcoin, or they 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 work on Bitcoin, but they are very very interested. And those are institutional investors as well. So they will influence. Maybe it's a generational thing as well. But it's it's very encouraging to see uh, quants from all over the world, all sorts of banks, even central banks. Um, uh, personally taking an interest in this and, and making investments in this. Well, it's a truly a very bullish setup. Actually, at uh, Bitcoin 2019, Brendan Bernstein made a comment saying something, I can't remember the exact words, but I think he was saying, you know, if you put me in a room and asked me to design the perfect bullish setup for Bitcoin, I could not imagine or design a better one than what we have right now. He's right. He's right. Well, we're, we're at a certain... So, uh, um, some something of a perfect storm right now with a, a recession uh, around the corner. Uh, yield curves are inverting everywhere, are going negative. The recession might already have started, uh, so that's that's a very nice test case for Bitcoin. If it will be a, um, um, yeah, a, a negatively an uncorrelated asset, because we have not uh, have the opportunity to test it till now. Uh, Bitcoin was made in. The last big recession, right? Two thousand eight. It was. It was the reason it was made. Uh, but we haven't had a big, real big recession until, well, maybe now or or next year. So that's one. And the uh, quantitative easing, of course, is a big uh, unknown. And then, yeah, Bitcoin is growing like like and crazy and adapted by more and more uh, investors. So yeah, I I totally agree with uh, Brandon. Excellent. Well, look, I think that's pretty much all we uh, had to cover for today so plan b before we let you go just make sure you tell the listeners where can they find you and what what are you looking for in terms of feedback okay so i'm uh, at twitter my twitter account is uh, at 100 trillion us dollars uh if you don't have read the article on medium um please please do so because it has a lot of the background uh, of the model and uh it might might answer a lot of your questions. Also, if you haven't heard the first podcast where we uh, discuss the model into uh, detail, please uh, please uh, listen to that one. 
and um, make sure you look out for the next Medium uh, articles. So uh, we're writing two, one about the altcoins and the stock to flow, and one about the spurious regression, stationary uh, or non-stationary variables, more uh, econometric uh, paper. Um, and I'm always open to suggestions. My DM is open. Um, comments are, are welcome. And if you are a quant uh, working at a big firm, have some ideas, please uh, reach out. And that would be great. All right. Well, look, that's, that's been a fantastic episode. I really enjoyed that discussion, Plan B. So once again, thank you for joining me today. Thank you very much, uh, Stefan. I hope you guys enjoyed that chat with Plan B. And just a quick reminder to check out my sponsors. They are who make this possible. So go and check out Kraken and Unchained Capital. Lastly, just an announcement about a new Australian Bitcoin education venture I'm launching with my co-founder, Katan. It's Ministry of Nodes. We believe there's a need for more guidance and handholding for Australian Bitcoiners who want to learn how to run a Bitcoin full node and also just basic digital security, hygiene and privacy practices. So we're setting up a website and a web store and we will be also looking to run workshops starting in Sydney but also around Australia. So make sure you check out the web store and the Twitter account. We will be posting up material there with some guides and articles but also targeted to an Australian audience. So make sure you check that out. That's it from me. Thanks, guys, and I'll speak to you soon.